the fullness of the body of Christ. Who is the bride of Jesus Christ? Doubtless in the mind of John the Baptist and of the first disciples of Jesus Christ, the bride was still Israel. Jesus had come to espouse the ancient people of God and raise them to the throne from which they had been deposed by their enemies. But in the thoughts of Jesus, as his ministry advanced, a new Israel took the place of the old, an Israel composed of men of all nations and languages who should believe on him and keep his commandments. He calls this new people of God his congregation as contrasted with the congregation of the ancient Israel. I will build, he says, my ecclesia. When Jesus speaks of my ecclesia, my congregation, he clearly distinguishes between the old Israel and a new Israel which is his, while setting forth the continuity of the new with the old by the very choice of a word which had in the Greek Bible represented the old. What Christ's Israel Christ's congregation or church was to be, we learn as his teaching advances, before the Passion he speaks of this gospel of the kingdom being preached for a testimony into all the nations. After the resurrection he sends his disciples to make disciples all over the world. And the same thing is taught in the parables of the Great Supper and the marriage of the King's Son where the servants are sent into the highways and hedges of the open country and bidden to call as many as they could find to the wedding, and the wedding is presently furnished with guests. Here we have quite plainly the call of the Gentiles and the formation of a universal church, no longer limited to Israel. In the parables of the kingdom indeed the bidden are the guests of the bridegroom and not the bride. The bride herself does not appear in the parables of the kingdom, if we accept the doubtful reading in Matthew 25, 1, and later in the New Testament, where she is mentioned, it is with reference to the second coming of the Lord. For the bride is the spiritual and visible church, which is being made ready for the perusia, not the church in her present outward organization, but the sum of those within her who are preparing themselves for the Lord's coming, and are being gathered generation after generation into his presence. When he comes, all these will come with him, and these, with the addition of all like souls that are still on earth will be the acknowledged spouse of Christ. But does not the present visible church, with its order and its ministries, find a place in the parables of the kingdom? Certainly and in not a few of them. The universal church is to be seen in the worldwide field where wheat and tars grow together to the harvest in the net thrown into the sea of life, which encloses a great multitude of fishes, good and bad, in the supper chamber into which men are called, in the vineyard in which they labor. Its work in the world is symbolized by the sowing of the seed, the leavening of the lump, the casting of the net, the calling of the guests, the hiring of the laborers, the doing business with the pounds or the talents the watching of the virgins. The expansion of the church and its growing importance as a factor in a history of the world is seen quite plainly in the parable of the mustard seed. The rapid growth of unspiritual and evil men within the church and their intermingling with good and spiritual Christians, a necessary consequence of the church's progress in the world is quite obviously described in the parable of the tires, the darnel among the wheat. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the church in her endowment with spiritual gifts is as evidently depicted in the talents, while the more secret and personal work of the Spirit is foreshadowed in the silent growth of the seed, in the spreading of the leaven through the lump, 
in the oil in the vessel ready to feed the lighted torch of the wise virgin soul. And not the church only but the individual life in Christ is here in its many varieties. The man who comes upon the treasure without seeking it, the man who, while seeking for goodly pearls, finds one of great price, are complementary types of Christian character, both of which are needful to the completeness of the body of Christ. In the parable of the sower we see the various measures of fruitfulness which distinguish individual lives, while the pounds show how the same gifts may be turned to more or less advantage, according to individual character. It is evident that our Lord contemplated no monotonous uniformity in his church, but the free play of personal life. And yet how in the midst of much diversity there are certain features which are common to all genuine disciples, and mark them as his. There are in all the same inner and unseen growth and outward manifestation of the fruit of the Spirit. There are in all the sense of divine forgiveness and the exercise of the spirit of forgiveness towards fellow servants. There are in all, in more or less degree, the two aspects of Christian conduct which are symbolized by the watching of the virgins and the doing business with the pounds or talents, the contemplative, ascetic, side of the religious experience, and a side which is occupied by the active work of each man's calling.